your website is your business's storefront. And it says a lot more about you and your brand than you can say for yourself. So it's critical that we get our website right. Not perfect, but we get it right. So to help us out today, I brought on the show my good friend, Jen Olmstead, who is a brilliant marketer and website designer. Now, Jen is the lead designer and co-founder of Tonic Site Shop, where she and her team make the world's greatest templates for the modern entrepreneur. And if you've been around the internet, you've probably seen Tonic's website designs for Leading entrepreneurs like Jenna Kutcher, Amy Porterfield, Boss Babe, Chris Loves Julia, and a whole lot more. And so Jen and her crew not only design sites for leading entrepreneurs like that, but they have created templates for all the other entrepreneurs like us so we can have that same level of quality and strategy in our websites. Jen and Tonic are known for their signature marketing content, which combines personality, storytelling, humor, and jam-packed value. And she's not joking. Her hashtag long and weird newsletter is quasi famous and you'll find some killer content on Instagram at tonic site shop. I love this part. Personally, Jen's a former journalist who grew up on an ostrich farm, a reluctant marketing nerd, and one of the few people still eating gluten. Her love language is witty banter and she's always up for a shot of espresso or a craft cocktail in that order. If you can't already tell already, you're going to love Jen. Uh, And in this episode, what we talked about was actually what to focus on in your website. Point Blake asked her, what should we be focusing on? What should our websites include? And also, maybe more importantly, what doesn't matter? Because a lot of us spend way too much time tweaking the things on our website that do not move the needle. And we finally broke down how you can present yourself and your online business to the world in the best way possible. This is a jam-packed episode highly tactical and practical. I think you're going to get a lot out of this, not just on the design front, but on the marketing strategy front when it comes to your website. So sit back and relax and enjoy my conversation with Jen Olmstead. Before we jump into the episode, real quick, I want to give you a gift. If you are an action taker and you are ready to launch your online business, even if you don't have a website ready or don't know what your idea is, I want to give you my 30-day online income jumpstart guide. This is not long. This is not an ebook. This is a PDF with bullet points. It is a four-week checklist. I stripped away all the fluff and said, if I needed to make money and I had zero audience and I needed to go from zero to putting money in my pocket in 30 days, what would I do and what would I tell my friends to do? That is what's in this guide. It'll help you crystallize your idea, get in front of an audience, make a product, make an offer, and make your first sale 30 days from now. And what that'll do for you is build up a ton of confidence, create proof of concept so that you know that you have a profitable, tested idea that can make money and then you can scale it from there. It's absolutely free. It's my gift to you from listening to this episode. Just click the link below if you're watching on YouTube or go to grahamcochran.com slash jumpstart. That's grahamcochran.com slash jumpstart. All right. Enjoy the episode. So Jen, I'm pumped to have you on here because I don't think we've had like a formal interview conversation like this, but we've been connected through my wife, Shay. That's how I got to know you with Shay. I know. I mean, it's really fun because I was realizing like we, I think I first encountered you when we were both doing a guest spot on something for Shay. And I was like, I kind of knew that Graham was a smart guy, but like, I hadn't seen that in action. And then I was like, oh, like everything you were saying, I was like, yes, like I am. Yes, I'm all in on that. And then I know we connected afterwards and you're like, yeah, I really appreciate what you have to say. So I'm glad we had like a mutual admiration society moment. And that came full circle today to sit down and, and actually talk about some of the stuff I know that we're both kind of obsessed with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I love your business and your business model. And then I, I love your Instagram feed. Like I, I, as someone who kind of loathes social media, I know. You're, like a, you're like a balm to like the weird, soul. <laughs> you're like the oasis in the desert of stupid social media. Yours is actually worth following, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, my first question, I'm though, I, no, I'm, re- I'm just hold on. Go I'm going to rewrite my Instagram bio and it's now just going to be a, a balm in the sea of Instagram stupid. That's that's now that's our Instagram bio. I'm quoting you. That's perfect. You can do that as long as I get 2% Great. stake in your company. 
that's no. Yeah. <laughs> and for that reason, We're, I'm out. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, okay. Fair on. enough. No. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to start off because one, one thing I love about your, and you do this well with your brand, but like you're very open about your love of cocktails and uh, your favorite cocktail is an old fashioned, which is the same for me. So my first question is very important. Which is your favorite bourbon or whiskey when you're making an old fashioned? I mean, I like, I love great whiskey. Like I love a Willet or something like that. That would be one of my favorites, but that's for more neat drinking. I, what I reach for most often is bullet for sure. For an old fashioned, um, it has like a little bit of smokiness, but I think it's just great in an old fashioned and it really complements the orange, orange well. So what about, what about you? Look at that. You got an answer and a reason for your answer. I love it. Um, bullet is excellent. You know, I always just have Woodford at the house. I just am so happy yeah. when it's either in a drink or just by itself. It's funny. Um, I had a meeting with like a, when I was working with a new CPA a couple years ago and he did the whole thing like, oh, hey, I've got a you're a bourbon drinker. I've got a bottle of Blanton's here that I just happened to have. And I, I <laughs> had never had any. And it was like a two hundred and fifty dollar bottle. Oh, yeah. Of whiskey. And I was like, oh, was, and I realized he's just got like bottles and bottles of this stuff that like he wows his clients with anyway. Um, I he just keeps that, it on hand. So. Yeah. I've never felt poorer than I went to, um, a client's house and they had, you know, the horses that are on top of the Blanton's bottle. They just had those out like as decoration. And I realized like what a subtle flex it is to be like, here's like $1,700 worth of bourbon, just as like casual decoration as corks in this bowl. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's, that's a, that's a, a flex you like have to have context for. Um, but it was a flex nonetheless. It was a whole new world. Yeah, that's uh, that's next level. It okay, was. so let's talk about tonic because uh, I want to get I want to get a little bit of the story of your business and what you're doing, and then I do want to dive into you know your one of your realms of expertise, which is websites, and I want I want to help our people make their websites more effective. Um, but you've been running tonic and you've been selling websites and templates since 2013. Uh, but before that, you were a journalist. So yeah, tell me about that. What kind of stories did you write? Were they sassy funny sarcastic like your instagram feed were they very serious was it like just news like tell me about the journalism side yeah so i went to college for journalism and i at first i was like i want to be a news anchor i'm going to be like dan diane sawyer and then i realized like the average lifespan of a journalist and of like especially a tv journalist is like the trajectory is like you have to be super hot then you're a weather girl then you're too old to be a weather girl and you get to be like a serious reporter and then you're not hot enough to be on TV anymore and you just have to be done. And I was like, is that the life I really want? No, that's not what I want. Um, and so immediately that, that just became a non-entity and I've always loved to write. That's been my favorite thing for so long. And so I did have a very sassy like Zanga blog um, in high school and college. And it was really funny because it's not unlike what I write now. Probably that was like the origin of like my newsletters that I write now, but that was weirdly successful in high school and college. And so I had this bit of success with, with journalism. And I remember sitting down, I went to a really, um, like classical liberal arts, very intense university. And I sat down with my journalism professor and he was like, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to write for the New York times? Do you want to write for the New Yorker? And I was like, I want to write for the onion and you could just see like the light yes. slowly go out of his eyes um and i was like that's that's my dream he's like that's your dream and i was like kind of um and so <laughs> i i'm very grateful to him in retrospect because he really let me my professor really let me pursue a lot of that in college and so one of my favorite accomplishments is that i wrote a dr love column in college where I would both write like the like lonely hearts question. And then I wrote like the romantic advice. And oh it was gosh. my first, it was my first understanding of like, when you write interesting or funny things in a boring context, people will read it and pay attention. And so no one was reading the student newspaper and I became the editor. We introduced some things like that, like the doctor love column. And suddenly everyone in the cafeteria was reading the paper because it was entertaining and it was relevant to them. And it was about, you know, the person in chapel that fell, a, fell in love with the, the music guy that day and wasn't sure how to pursue it. And, you know, whenever you can make comedy out of people's everyday lives, they pay attention. So that was kind of my, my first introduction to that whole concept. And then after school, I, I started writing just a little bit on occasion. I wrote some for Slate and a couple of other publications that was not like funny stuff. And then that's whenever I realized, because I was in the editor of college, my first decision was like, what font 
should we change the body font to for the paper? Um, how should we redesign this? And so that kind of became the first entry point of like, oh, when you tell a story beautifully, mm-hmm. instead of just in poor design, people pay attention. And mm-hmm. so my college hired me to do a bunch of their marketing and design. And then after that, my friends started either getting married and needing um, wedding invitations or starting businesses and needing logos and graphic design. So those were the two tracks. And so very quickly, I shifted from that journalism background um, right into design and still using using a lot of that storytelling. But primarily, that was when I was like, oh, design matters. That's so cool. So journalism and writing came first, design came yeah. second. Mm-hmm. So, so then how did yeah. you get into web design specifically? Yeah. So that was an interesting thing because I have never, um, I've never been a coder. I've never been a developer. And so that was a limitation that I had because I would have brands or friends say, Hey, we love what you did for our logo and, um, our branding, but can you design our website? And I would just say no, because I didn't have the tools that I needed. And I knew that I'm OCD enough that I would ruin some poor developer's life being like, Hey, I need you to shift this three pixels to the right. And that happened enough times where I was like, this is not, I just can't, I can't do this. I'm not a web designer. Um, and then a friend of mine was like, Hey, actually there's a new platform called show it. And it's much more drag and drop. It's no code. I think you would love it. And that was my first introduction almost probably 11, maybe 12 years ago to the platform that I still use now, which is now a totally different platform. But it was my first experience of, oh, I can make a website do anything I want. I can create a website that like breaks every design rule in the book. I can create a website that's really unique. I can do it myself. And um, because I hadn't had a background in web design, I didn't have any limitations for what a website had to be. And as a result, a lot of my early websites I designed were kind of weird and a little bit avant-garde um, and probably just weren't great design. Now, in retrospect, I'm like, would be embarrassed, but they did stand out. And so a bunch of my early clients, um, they were like billboards for my design services because thankfully in that niche of photography, people knew that websites mattered. And so they would land on one of my clients' websites and be like, oh, who designed this? And they would reach out having seen my work. I didn't even have, a, I didn't even have my own website at this point. Um, wow. But I began to just like gain so many referrals from these clients and from the sites that I had done. And so all of a sudden I was a website designer and I had to learn to figure out what the hell I was doing after that. That's fascinating. It's so interesting because I love the piece about not really knowing what a website should look like, whatever should means or what current design exactly. is. Because it, it it forces you to come in with something fresh because you're not like, you know, poisoned or you're not drinking the cool. You're not like brainwashed into th- right. it, it, thinking what it should look like. And I was thinking about uh, there's a you ever watch the the show Hot Ones on YouTube. Like, yeah, it's an interview mm-hmm. series where they they interview celebrities and eat chicken wings that are really hot. So I was yeah. watching. Um, I was Tom hoping we we're going to do that today, but I guess not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, oh, like check your mailbox. There's some hot sauce. In there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Maybe I should. Um, Tom Holland, who plays Spider-Man right now, they, he was on the show and he was uh, it's probably like, well, like a year ago. And he was like eating hot wings and they were asking him about how he got into acting because he really started young in, on the West End in London on the musical yes. Billy Elliot, a 12 year old. But he never went to acting school. He never went to drama school. And so the, the guy was asking him, like, do you feel like it was an advantage, a disadvantage? Because like all these other people go to these big, you know, fancy Prestigious. drama schools. Yeah. Yeah. And you just like came in and his response was like, I think it was an advantage that I didn't go to school because I didn't know what you were supposed to do. So I just showed up and just did. And he said, even to this day with movies, I don't memorize my lines until the day of a a scene, which I think is kind of crazy because I want to like, but because I want it to feel so fresh and not have like thought about it too much. And I think there's something there. So I was thinking about that with your website design. You were just kind of creating and reacting in real time to what felt good to you. Right. And I did know there was a lot I did know. So I didn't know that a website was supposed to be X. I didn't know like a menu has to look like this. And this is early 2000s or like mid 2000s. And so most websites were terrible at this time. Like there was no, it was either you paid $75,000 to have some giant agency do it and it still looked terrible 
or you did it yourself and it looked terrible. There were very few great websites during this time, but because I didn't know website design and I hadn't been to art school, I always thought up until maybe, you know, five years ago, I was like, man, I really wish I'd gone to art school. I really wish I'd majored in graphic design because then I would know all these things these other designers know. What I neglected to realize is that I knew how to tell a story. I knew how to write a great headline. I knew how to keep people's interest and make them read something they didn't want to read, which is like an entire point of your website is like, how do you capture someone's interest who's clicking from tab to tab to tab and make them go, ooh, this is interesting. I want more of this. And those were all things that I did know. And so it was fascinating because I would have clients that had worked with other designers and I would be asking them questions about their brand. Like, Mm. what would your brand feel like? Like if it was a room, um, what do you think are like the problems that your client has like today that they're looking for? And they were like, no, no other designers asked us any of this wow. stuff before. Um, and so it was interesting because I knew like, how do you interview someone and find out like what's going on in their head? And that was fascinating to me of like, how do we translate your brand so that it's visually represented at its best online? That was the point of the website. It wasn't just like have a placeholder with content on it that people can find when they Google you. That was a totally different concept. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's perfect. because That's where I wanted to go next was like, how people think about what's the role of their website, which maybe you don't think about. A lot of people just want to have one and it becomes a placeholder or a giant like business card of like, check out my this, check out my this. Here's my phone number. Here's my Instagram. Here's my thing. Um, You were really coming into website design from a business strategy of like, well, what are you trying to accomplish? And let's make the site fit that. So to that point, if you had to boil it down, what do you think is the number one role of a a website for a brand these days? Like what is the purpose of a website today? Yeah. I mean, I think the entire purpose of your website is to explain what you do, why your customer should do business with you and not anyone else. And then what are the benefits of doing that? What are they going to get out of the equation? Um, And a great website does that clearly. It does it efficiently. It does it with some sort of entertainment value um, that's captivating. And so that's what I think a website can be. But I think a lot of people, like you just alluded to, view their website as like this box they have to check. They know they have to have one, but they don't view it as like the most important tool that they have in their arsenal. And I always say like, neglecting your website is like telling your star of salesmen to just like take a break for the few next few years. Like Mm. just sit on the bench because like your time will come later. We don't really need you out here, but really a powerful website can take someone from like vaguely interested in you to someone who's like compelled to work with you and it can take you from like one option and like a sea of tabs to the only person they now want to work with or invest in. And I think like, There's a great study that I saw recently that said 94% of people who land on your homepage are not ready to buy. So if you think about what opportunity that is, if your website is designed to convert, then it can take 94%. It's going to take a huge percentage of those people who aren't ready and convert them for you. And that means you don't have to sell them because your website can sell for you. Your website doesn't sleep. Your website doesn't go on vacation. Your website doesn't take a nap. Your website doesn't go out of office. Your website is always there. And there's so much opportunity. But I think so many people are like, well, I just have to have it. I'm going to set it and forget it. In fact, I'm going to let it sit there until I finally look at it in five years and feel like I need to burn it down. And that is the biggest thing that I want to solve is like, no, 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 no. Your website is a living, breathing representation of your business every day. It is also the first place people go when they're serious about interacting with your brand or purchasing from you. Because I don't care if it's the local like bagel shop or the bar down the street or like the hot wing place. Um, People are going to go to their website when they want to see if it's legit, if they want to make a purchase, if you want to do anything. And I think in our culture... Um, people have begun to believe that that, that's Instagram's job. Mm -hmm. Like, well, my website's terrible, but I keep my Instagram up to date. And I'm like, no, 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 your, your Instagram is like your storefront, but people cannot buy anything from you outside your store. They cannot buy anything when they're standing on the street looking in, they have to go to the next step. And that next step is your website always. 
Yeah, that's such a great analogy. And I was thinking that because I was while you're talking about websites, I'm like, the reason why people don't do anything good with their websites is because they're so focused on their Instagram or their TikTok or their social media platform. And, yeah. and it's just a different tool. And right. it's like, obviously, in a perfect world, you have all of it and it's all you're crushing right. all of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I never think about that. I always think about, okay, let's start with what's the most important thing you could have. And to your point, it's your website. Now that doesn't mean it right. has to be the biggest, most complex. Oh. I, I've seen like one page websites that you land on it and I can't stop scrolling. Like I, I'm like so yeah. hooked and it's just good copy, which really is just getting in the mind of the right person, which means this person understands who they're trying to serve and what those pain points are. It's really nothing magical. But that's the most important thing. And then everything else would point to it. Because to your point, I was just listening to like a dorky financial podcast that was awesome. But like I was nerding out over uh, like life insurance and investment strategies. And this guy sounded like a genius who was the guest. And so I just Googled his name and there was some articles. There was an Instagram, but I wanted to go to his website. So I went to his website to just see how does how does he present himself in his home? Because that's like your home right. turf. Yes. So the that's best, I, like that's you at your best, right? Like yes. that's your brochure. That's your billboard. So people are like, this is going to be it for you. Like I'm going to get you. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's also convicting <laughs> for me because like, I, I, feel, I always like, like I value the website so, so much, but then I'm doing so many other things, right. As an entrepreneur, right. right. Like, okay, I have a website. So then a couple of years go by, you're like, oh, I haven't even looked at my website. <laughs> I should probably I see if anything's changed. Is that still up? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like, oh man, that's not relevant anymore at all. Okay. So let's talk about websites. Then what are the mistakes? Yeah. Like you've seen it all. You're probably like, like for me, I come from a musician audio background. So if I go to a concert or usually it's not because concerts, they do well, but if I go to a church and the sound yeah. the sound quality is so bad, I can't, I just cannot pay attention. I can't worship. Right. I can't enjoy it. Cause my brain is hearing, Oh my gosh, I need to fix that frequency. Why is the bass <laughs> so low? What is he doing with the snare drum? This is ridiculous. So for you, it's probably the same when you see websites Oh yeah, and you're like, Oh my gosh. Like maybe even you look at mine, you're like, Oh gosh, why is Graham doing this? What are like the two to three, like the biggest mistakes you see people like entrepreneurs, like they have a legit yeah. brand and maybe, mm -hmm. you know, they're not a beginner necessarily because we all make mistakes as beginners, but you're like, wow, they're actually making money, but their website, what are they doing? What do you see? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the first one is just what we alluded to just now is just straight up neglect right? It's like, this is not my priority. And because, and I get it as entrepreneurs, we are like putting out fires. We are like, um, always focusing on the tyranny of the urgent, whatever has to be done for us to get where we're trying to go. And there's so many things crowding in, demanding our attention at all times. But last summer I was speaking at this amazing event in California and there's a room full of extremely talented interior designers. And these are women like whose aesthetics were super on point. There were so many hats in the room. Like everyone had hats, um, very well dressed, like very successful, very successful. And I was speaking about website design and branding. And I was like, okay, like honesty hour, like we're all friends here, circle of trust. How many of you are, are happy with your website? And two people, um, raise their hand two people in this audience of like plus 60 plus and then i was like how many of you would be like petrified if i said like i'm gonna pull your website up oh, right gosh. now yeah and like 58 people you know the, the vast majority of people were like please please do not go to my website and to me that just said everything because these women had massive instagram followings but they were like jen don't go to my website please that's not the thing that is going to convert you. And I was just seeing that as like, man, that's so unfortunate because you guys are talented, you're great, and your website is not showing any of that. And that is just the missed opportunity of neglecting your website. And I think it's really shifting your mentality from like, my website is something I have to have to my website is like the foremost brochure for my business. It's getting visited every day. I know how vital it is for every arm of my business. And I always just say it's like, it's the hub. It's like where you send people from social media. It is, it is where people go after meeting you and being like, wow, this person seems legit. Just like you, it's where you go after hearing someone on a podcast being like, oh, that guy seems pretty smart. So I think just neglect would be the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the second one is just not answering the biggest question that people have when they visit your website. Mm. 
which in my opinion, that question is just, will this work for me? Um, Will this or this person or this service or this Mm. product, will it work for me? Is this product going to fix my problem? Is it going to meet my needs? Is it going to get me what you want? Um, Now, I am not one of the like marketing people who says like, every product or service needs to fix a problem. Because as my friend, Laura Belgray says, like, sometimes you just need to buy a hair dryer. You don't have like this deep emotional problem with like wet hair. That's fair. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's totally fair. true. But what is, what is the question that, what do people need from you? Mm. What do they need your product to do? What are they hoping to find? What do they want from you? And then how are you uniquely equipped to meet that need or solve that problem for them? That is the, that is the only thing your website really needs to answer. And, and we refer to that in marketing. And I know you know this as just like, what's your unique value proposition? What is the thing that you offer and the way that you offer it that isn't replicated by another business or another brand? And I always just say like, two ways of finding this are like, number one, what are some like assumptions that your client might have when it comes to your product or service? And like, how will you challenge those things? So in our case, you know, people's assumptions are like website templates suck. They are lesser quality than a custom website. So what we ask to challenge that is like, what if that's not true? What if a website can actually get you where you're going faster? What if they're designed with intention and strategy? What if you're getting a $30,000 website for $1,500? So we challenge that assumption. And that was one way we established like, this is where we stand out. The second way I think to do this is just determine what is it about you, your expertise, your knowledge, your persona, your perspective, your experience that allows you to get that client what they want differently or better than someone else. So maybe it's that you're a photographer who's just as obsessed with like a really smooth client process as you are with images. That's rare, right? Like most people like I'm an artist, but my customer service, like that's not my thing, but you're going to get great photos. So if that's not you, that's what you're selling, right? You're like, I'm going to get you great photos and you're going to enjoy the process getting there. That's your UVP. So that's what I think your website just has to answer is like, what is this going to work for me and how can you do it better or differently than someone else? So that's the next thing that I think is just vital. Yeah. I I love that, especially the unique side because people, and I appreciate you trying to give some application there because I know I can hear people's brains going, yeah, but (laughs) but I'm not unique. And I, I get this question a lot, even before people want to start a business in, in, you know, the knowledge commerce space of like, well, everyone's already covered whatever my topic is, what's unique about me. And that just stems from so much deep insecurity that we all have in imposter syndrome. Cause we're, we're always looking and comparing and, and, you know, I don't know what that deep need is of wanting to be different. Um, and I always tell people, you don't have to be different. You just have to add value. But what I like about what you're saying is, and this really applies to you guys, if you're doing courses or memberships or any kind of info, info product is, um, we're all teaching the same thing. Like when I jumped into teaching online business, I I punted on jumping into this space for three years because I was like, well, Amy Porterfield's got it covered. You know, all these other people, (laughs) why should I jump it with Amy's one of your clients, by the way, too. So Jed's uh, killing it, but it's like, what, why should I show up in this space? Like I, I I punted because I was so insecure. Like it's just going to be the same and I don't want to do that. Um, And then I, I eventually just got over myself and jumped in um, and I've discovered like for like five and a half years of now doing this brand, people are like, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're in this space because I was following so and so and so and so. But like the way you explain it, it's like a breath of fresh air. I'm like, Oh, that is so strange because I'm just explaining it the way it makes sense to me. So I'm thinking for these people listening and watching that, like with your unique value proposition, it could be a specific skill set that you do differently. It could just be, especially in the info space an interesting stance you have an interesting point of view that like good comedians are willing to like joke about the thing that we're all like thinking about in our heads, but we're afraid and embarrassed to say out loud. Good marketing sometimes is saying like, Hey, I like for me, I'll make fun of like paid ads and like, I'll call out like the paid ad guys, not because I don't think it should work for anybody, but I I don't use them, never have. And it's fun to kind of like drop a grenade and be like, I think paid ads are dumb and you don't need them. And people are like, what? Or launches. Right. I don't think you need to do launches. Just do evergreen. People are like, what? And it just, right. it just allows you to stand out just a little bit. And to your point, get them to pay attention. And some people might not like that uniqueness, but that's the whole point. Someone else might like it very much. 
Yeah. And there's a great quote that I love from Seth Godin, who is not my client, but I would love to be. Hi, Seth, if you're listening to this, um, just call me. But it, the quote is mass means average. And in a crowded marketplace, fitting in is failure not standing out is the same thing as being invisible. And so I think like we think we're trying, we're doing a good thing by like making, be, being mass appropriate. We, we think we need to appeal to everyone, but really it's like you just said, when you're the one that's willing to say like, um, I actually don't really like social media and it's okay if you don't either, or like, it's fine. You know, in my case, like um, our marketing newsletters are like what most marketers would be like, this is a terrible idea, but I don't care because they work. And what I get is people saying, I had no idea I could enjoy writing an email. Um, but I'm enjoy, I enjoyed reading yours and maybe, maybe I could write stuff like this. Maybe marketing doesn't have to be boring. And I think that was something that's been so such a personal thing for me is that I probably for eight years of my business, I was like, I am terrible at marketing. I Mm. hate marketing. I am not a marketer. I would say that all the time of like, I'm not a marketer. I'm a designer. I'm an artist. That is not my thing. But what I realized literally in the past, probably four years is wait a second. I love stories. I love talking to people. I love connecting with them. I love like figuring out what makes other people good at what they do. I love writing content that helps explain things to other people. Guess what? that's marketing. (laughs) Um, And so when I leaned into more of like, well, what is it that interests me about marketing? What do I find interesting about this? What, like you said, is like, what is my take on things that people may not understand? What do I know that's super like inherent to me, but that other people might not know um, that would be like a breath of fresh air, like you just said, how can I lean into more of that? And that's where we found this weird rhythm of like, the more we've been like, hey, this is my take. This is our stance. This is a way that you can understand this. And where we've sought to just add value in all of our marketing, I've just fallen in love with what marketing can be because marketing is just storytelling and Mm. connection. That's it. There are two things that marketing is. And so if you can do those things well, which a lot of people can, if they learn, then you can be a great marketer and that's all it is. Yeah, I love that. I think I think everyone loves stories and everyone loves connecting with people. Even even introverts like me love connecting with people. It's just maybe not a hundred people talking to me at once. But it's like yeah. something happens, something breaks in our brain the moment we like open up our website template. Let's say maybe I buy a template from you and it's now it's time to write what should the headline be? And it's like all of that natural ability to like share a cool story or like this was really funny or this is an yeah. experience I had goes out the window and we start to just type like markety stuff that sounds like to <laughs> Seth's yes. point, everything else. So do you have any suggestions or like what can somebody do like in the actually I'm sitting down to write some of the key copy on my site Is there an exercise I can do or a frame of mind I should be in to make sure what comes out doesn't sound like a Wells Fargo like homepage and it sounds like my unique brand? Yes. I I love this question. I do think that's true because all of a sudden you become like this weird marketer robot and you say things like you never thought you would say and you're using chow casually and you're like, how am I this person (laughs) right now? (laughs) You know, so we, there are several resources. One of them I'll just mention it. And, um, it's called, we have a, it's called our attract and repel guide. And basically Mm. all it is, is just some really solid voice of customer research. So we'll make sure that that's linked in the um, show notes for you guys, our attract and repel guide. That's a great place to start because the biggest hack for writing copy is that you don't have to originate your copy. You shouldn't write it from scratch. You should not open a Google document right now and be like, I'm going to write my website. What you do first is you let your customers write it for you. And this is what I'm talking about. Basically, you ask your customers a set of questions Hey, what are some problems that you had prior to working with me? Pick, do this right after this podcast, pick three or four of your favorite recent clients and say, Hey, I'm doing some research on, on my brand. I'm, I would love to feature you on my website. And could I ask you a couple of questions? Ask them some questions like this. Number one, Hey, what were some problems you had prior to working with me? Um, what were you experiencing? What was frustrating for you? Number two, what was it like working together? What did you appreciate about the process? Is there anything that you would note? 
Um, number three, um, what would you say to someone considering working with me or considering purchasing my product? What would you tell them? And then my favorite kind of magic question is just, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah. and don't skip that one because weirdly people will just give you like monosyllabic first answers. And then they'll, you'll say like, is there anything else you'd like to add? And they're like, well, actually like your product gave me reason to live this year. And you're just like, where was that? <laughs> so those questions, what yeah. happens is when you see you, it's like, if you can picture those kind of word clouds where you begin to see these common themes and what your customers say. So maybe it's something like they say, like, I was so frustrated because I couldn't find a photographer who just responded to my emails. And you see like, oh, two customers said that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Or it's a business coach that was like, I just felt like everyone was so salesy. And I was yeah. so tired of being sold to. I just want someone who understood. Or I was looking for a mentor in my business, not someone who was just one and done, just trying to get me off a Zoom call so they could collect their check. So in your copy, all of a sudden, it's like, hey, tired of being sold to by marketing guys who just want to get you off a Zoom call so they can collect your check. Yep. Boom. Headline writing done. Like killer headline. And it's because it's what your customers were actually saying. And here's what happens when you have customers that land on your website. They're like, how the heck did Graham know that? How did he know I was experiencing that? How did he know I was feeling that way? Like this man gets it. Like how, like, this is incredible. This is, this guy is the only one that I want to hire for this service. And that to me is just like, demystifying copying 101 copywriting 101 is like you don't have to write everything do great research and your customers will write your copy for you oh my gosh thank you so much uh, like that's like a mini master class in copywriting. <laughs> like what you just shared in the last like five minutes is worth like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars like this year for people if they implement yeah because what it's fascinating we and, and you, we can probably all think of some of our favorite sites that we land on we we just like as marketers, business owners, we kind of like fangirl or fanboy over the copy. We're like, oh, that's so good. Like, and, yeah. and sometimes it's, so we can appreciate what went into it. But if to your point, the example, somebody lands on the site and goes, oh my gosh, how did she know? How did he know? It seems like mind reading because of two reasons. One, we all think that we're special snowflakes and that our, our problems are unique. We're, we're really, the more you interact with people to do the work you just described of doing, of interviewing your customers or prospects, you realize everyone for the most part has the same challenges in this space. You're going to see patterns yeah. of what everyone's dealing with. So it's not actually unique problems you're trying to solve. So if you just figure out what those real problems are and then you just gurgitate it back to them, then they feel like you're reading their minds and, 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 they're, and you're starting your website from the, the headline from a place of empathy. And that is like the doorway yeah. to selling because it's like, wow, like you said it, he gets me, she gets me. Yes. Magic. I love that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And a, a good like kind of first step of this is just what do your customers actually want? And I was just looking at the MailChimp website this morning because they're, they're a company, they get it. They get benefit-driven copy design. When you land on their website, it's clear what they offer, but it's clear what the benefits are for you. So if you're just selling wedding photography and you're one of a billion other wedding photographers, you're going to have to find some benefits that are beyond just like, I will shoot your wedding. So for MailChimp, what I love is I think their current headline on their site says, turn emails into revenue. It does not say the world's greatest email marketing platform or like, send decent emails or anything really related to sending emails or what their platform does because they realize what their customer actually wants is revenue. So that is what they're offering is like, Hey, we're going to help you turn emails into revenue. And you can't do that if you don't understand why people are actually working with you. What do they actually want? That's a, that's a great example. And everyone like, see how simple that headline is. It's not yeah. very fancy. Turn emails into revenue. It's almost like, you know, they're in a board meeting and they're like, well, basically what people want to do, right. Is they want to turn emails into revenue. And someone says that should be the headline. That's, <laughs> it. Exactly. That's how I came up with the title for my book. I had a couple of working titles and they all sucked. And then I tried to get creative and those, I thought they were cool. And my publisher, and I mean, none of us really loved it. And I remember the publisher saying like, well, like, what would you say the book is really about? And I'm like, well, it's, it's about like how to get paid for what you know. He's like, well, that's yeah. the title. Then <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. okay. Like don't overthink totally. it. Totally. 
And literally that is a good like beta test of like what you should actually do. That's your litmus test of like, read your headline out loud to someone. And if they don't get it, rewrite it. Like if you're being cute and we say this all the time, um, you know, I land on a, a florist website and it's like turning the wonder of creation into beauty. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. But like, yeah. what did the hell, what the hell do you actually do? Yeah. Or, you know, a photographer, it's like capturing your joy eternally. And I'm like, so are you a photographer? Are you a writer? Like, how are you capturing my joy? You know, are you capturing my joy, like in captivity in some way? <laughs> you know, what, Stealing what, yeah. You, are you taking it from me oh or do gosh. I get it back? You know? And so, <laughs> so but that's where like, it's, you know, we're so tempted oh to be gosh. cute because we are trying to stand yeah. out. Right. But your best, your best headline is like, what does someone actually want? How can you convey to them that you get it? And then explain to them how you can help them get it. Like first a, what do they want? Part B, how can you help them get it? And then C like click here to book now, buy now, add to cart. Like that's all you got to do. Um, yeah. So, and I would be remiss. There's one other po point of this that I think is very important because the most powerful thing, in addition to this copy structure that we're talking about is you say it right. Like if you want wedding photography that does X, I can do that for you. What you need after that is 10 clients that say, I was looking for a wedding photography that did that. And this is the person that can do it for you. You need, and this is the biggest mistake, probably the third biggest mistake that I see is really not fully understanding how important testimonials, reviews, and social proof on your website can truly be um, for converting your brand. Because the stat that I love is that 31% of people are, that sorry, people are willing to pay 31% more for businesses that have great reviews, which basically mm. just means like they care about great reviews more than they care about saving money. So wow. you can charge more than your competitors. You could be a lot more than your competitors, but if you have the reviews that back it up, that say, actually, this was so worth the money and that are echoing your brand story that you're telling, then all of a sudden you're capable of, pro of providing so much more and then making more for what you do every single day. And this is the biggest thing I look for when I'm on someone's website is people will like have one review somewhere on a portfolio page. And that's why in all of our website templates, we build reviews in through every part of the, of the site where people what might make a purchasing decision. Because they are poised. They're looking for a reason to work with you. They want to be convinced they are on your website. Yep. And there's nothing more powerful. You can say all day long, like, my process is streamlined and efficient. But they are going to kind of think that you might be lying until 10 other people say, that process was so streamlined and efficient. Please don't go anywhere else. Jen Olm said, like, tonic websites are, like, the best in the game. When that many people say that, it is worth so many more times then you can put all the effort you want into your copy, but someone else saying that story for you is the best thing that you can possibly add to your website for your brand. Oh, I, love, I know it's yeah, like I a tangent, that. but no, 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 it's like had to fit like, that in. Yeah, because testimonials are like the most powerful copy. Would you say it almost to me sounds like a one-two punch on a website? Like punch yes. number one is like clear copy that addresses the person's pain and shows what makes you the person to deliver. It. And then the punch two is other people saying that as well as like the proof. Yeah. And then it's like, now you decide. Exactly. And it's like, I said it, customer says it. Now you can go get it like that. That's, we call it like the, the sales stack basically. And that's kind of, you'll see it over and over again in our website templates is like on the portfolio page. It's like, here's a piece of gorgeous work. Here's a client saying like, guess what? Working with them was even better than the work. And there's a button saying, click here to book your date because people are like, is this too good to be true? Oh, maybe not now I want it. Like, let's go. Um, and so I think that having that kind of sales stack over and over again throughout your website is just going to increase conversion, you know, many, many, many fold. Oh my gosh. I love that. This is so fun. I hate to yeah. cut this off. Cause like I could nerd out over no. this forever. Um, but maybe we'll yeah. have you back and do like a straight up sales copy. Part two. Mass part let's two.
This was awesome. So Jen, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for taking a website conversation to where it really is, which is the words that you say on the website. You do need a beautiful website and all of Tonic's sites yeah. and their templates are amazing. That's why the, big, like the Amy Porterfields are using her and the Jenna Kutcher's like the big names are using Tonic because she's world class and what they do there is world class, but also her superpower, which you could apply no matter what your website platform is, is the words that you say and the way to think strategically about the website. So this was so valuable. Right. Um, we, we're going to put the attract and repel guide in the show notes, but you also have something really cool happening right now that um, you're putting together, which is like your trend guide for the year. Uh, can you talk about that yeah. and point people to where they can pick that up? Totally. So we are so excited. Um, this is our opportunity to nerd out. And basically our trend report, our 2023 trend report is just our guide to what we think is going to be vital for entrepreneurs to know and apply in 2023 across social media, digital marketing, their website and design. And in addition to me just making grandiose predictions, um, we also brought in some very smart friends of ours, including you, obviously, um, to make predictions and to basically outline for you like, hey, what do you need to keep in mind as you run your business this year? What's going to be increasingly important and how can you adapt your business to reflect that? So you can snag that guide at tonicsiteshop.com slash trend. And it's a really fun one. And then I'll also just mention, because we're talking about so copy, um, that, you know, all of our tonic templates, I write all of the placeholder copy on um, all of our templates. And so we build them with the same strategy that you and I are talking about of like, here's what a headline might look like. Um, this is what you could say here. So if you're looking for something that has that same strategy built in, you don't have to wait until you're Amy Porterfield or Graham Cochran. Um, that's why we built these templates for you. Um, but they have that strategy baked in and that copy baked in. So just had to mention that as well. Yeah, because that's like worth another 10 grand right there. If like, can you just squeeze in Probably. some decent copy templates? Like, that's so yeah. juicy. And then that's why yeah. your, your templates are crushing. That's awesome. Okay, so tonicsiteshop.com slash trend. We'll put the link for the attract and repel guide. Uh, where can people find you and hang out with you online, Jen? Yeah, we'd love to have you. So we're over uh, on Instagram at Tonic Site Shop. And then we're on um, the full website. You can visit at tonicsiteshop.com. And you can hop on our long and weird email list at tonicsiteshop.com slash list. And yeah, it's kind of weird, but it's fun. Long and weird. That Her words. I love it. Yeah. Well, Jen, this has been so much fun. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Thanks for sharing. And uh, congratulations on all the success you have with your business. And I'm excited likewise. for where it's going to go in the next decade. Uh, well, likewise. Thank you so much for having me on. This is just, I could do this all day. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time for Hot Wings. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Jen as much as I did. Isn't she fantastic? There was a lot of good meat in this episode. So hopefully you took notes. And if not, just rewind and listen to it again. Take advantage of all the goodies that Jen dropped as well. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever, we're going to have all the links again in the show notes at GrahamCochran.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube, we'll link to it below this video. And like I said earlier, if you are ready to start your online business, do it in the next 30 days. Take my 30-day online income jumpstart guide. It's free. It's a four-week checklist of what to do to go from zero to putting money in your pocket a month from now. Yes, I'm serious. It won't be millions, but it will be money in your pocket, and you will have built the foundations of a scalable, profitable online business. It's absolutely free. Just go to grahamcochran.com slash jumpstart. All right, friend, thanks for tuning in today. Hope you have an amazing rest of your week, and we'll see you on another episode. Thanks. 